I didn't see what he was yelling at. I didn't see the ambulance coming, but I remembered him yelling. That was the last thing I heard from him. There's more. Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. He walked this earth. He is in heaven right now, interceding for you and for me. Imagine waking up from a near-death experience, not once, but three times, each time bringing a rapturous message from Jesus himself. Landon Whitley's story is not just a tale of survival. It is an extraordinary journey that takes us beyond the limits of the known, into realms where few have dared to tread. Landon, a young boy who survived a horrific car accident, was given the chance to experience heaven on three separate occasions while the world around him believed he was lost forever. Before we begin, I have a very serious question for everyone watching this video. Do you believe that Jesus is real and that God is alive? Do you believe in miracles? We would love to know your opinion in the comments. On October 19th, 1997, the Whitley family's lives changed forever. It was an ordinary Sunday afternoon, and like any other Sunday, they were returning home after church service. Julie and Andy Whitley were in the front seat, while Landon, just eight years old, sat in the back seat of his Pontiac Sunfire. The road seemed peaceful, and there was no indication that the day would end in tragedy. Suddenly, without any warning, an ambulance crossed the intersection at high speed and collided violently with the family car. The impact was brutal, hitting the driver's side where Andy was sitting. In an instant, what was supposed to be an ordinary Sunday trip turned into an indescribable nightmare. The car was destroyed, with the bodies of Andy and Julie seriously injured and Landon trapped in the wreckage. First responders quickly arrived at the scene, but did not realize there was a child in the vehicle until much later. Landon was hidden in the wreckage of the car, his small body barely recognizable from the impact. When they finally found him, he wasn't breathing. Desperate, rescuers began working frantically to save him. Landon was taken by helicopter to the hospital, but during the flight, he suffered two cardiac arrests. At the hospital, he died once again, but doctors were able to revive him. When Landon was first declared clinically dead, his soul was transported to a place he never knew existed. He found himself in a vast field of light, with colors so vibrant that no earthly color palette could replicate. There was an indescribable peace, a sense of belonging that he had never experienced before. Landon described this place as heaven, a realm where time did not exist and where pain and suffering were unknown concepts. In the sky, Landon encountered figures that were familiar to him, but that he had never met in life. He saw his father, Andy, who had died in the accident, and other family members who had passed away before his birth. But the most surprising thing was when he saw two children he didn't recognize but who seemed to know exactly who he was. These children, as he would later discover, were his siblings, lost by Julie to miscarriages before he was born. In heaven, you just know who people are, Landon said. The most impressive presence of all, however, was that of Jesus. Landon described the figure of Jesus as an intense, warm light, emanating pure love. Jesus approached Landon and told him that he needed to return to earth, that his mission was not yet complete. He had to be a good Christian and tell the world about what he had seen. With this message, Landon was brought back to life, but his experiences in the afterlife were far from over. While Landon faced his spiritual battles, his mother, Julie, fought a very earthly battle. At the hospital, doctors had no hope that Landon would survive, and even if he did, they believed he would be left with permanent brain damage, unable to walk, talk, or even eat on his own. Julie, who had already lost her husband in the accident, refused to accept this fate for her son. She prayed incessantly, begging God to save Landon, even if it meant caring for a severely weakened son. For two weeks, Landon remained in a coma, 
hooked up to machines that kept his body functioning. Julie didn't leave his side, her faith being tested every day. She struggled with a mix of anger, sadness, and hopelessness, questioning why God allowed her family to go through so much pain. But even in the midst of darkness, Julie found the strength to continue praying, believing that God had not abandoned her son. Then, against all odds, Landon woke up. Doctors were stunned to discover he had no brain damage. Her recovery was nothing short of a miracle, but Julie knew that recovery wouldn't be complete without her telling Landon about her father's death. She feared how this would affect him, especially considering the experiences he had had while unconscious. When Julie finally found the courage to tell Landon about Andy's death, he surprised her once again. I know where he is, Mom, he said calmly. I saw him in heaven. Landon also told Julie about his siblings that he had met in the afterlife, something he could not have known as Julie had never mentioned the lost pregnancies. Landon's life changed forever after his first near-death experience, but fate had more surprises in store for him. Shortly after his initial recovery, Landon suffered another episode of cardiac arrest, and once again, he was taken to heaven. This time, his experience was even more intense. He found himself standing before a vast crowd of people, all smiling and waving at him as if they had been waiting for him. In the center of this crowd, Jesus appeared again, radiating light and warmth. Jesus reinforced the message he had given before, reminding Landon of his mission on earth. Each time Landon visited heaven, he returned with a new understanding of his life's purpose. He began to realize that his survival was not just a miracle, but a divine calling. He felt a growing responsibility to share his story, to tell the world what he had seen and experienced. Landon knew this mission would not be easy, but he was determined to fulfill what Jesus had asked of him. As Landon grew, the mission Jesus gave him became the center of his life. He and Julie began participating in events and programs where they shared their story, offering hope and comfort to those facing their own tragedies. One such program was Grief Share, a support group for grieving people, where Landon and Julie could talk about their experiences and help others find peace in the midst of their pain. Julie, who initially struggled with her faith after the accident, found new purpose after seeing how Landon's story impacted people. She believed that God had a plan for them and that despite all the pain they had faced, there was a greater purpose being fulfilled. Landon, in turn, dedicated himself to spreading the word of Jesus, telling everyone he knew about his experiences in heaven and the reality of divine love. Despite the physical injuries Landon suffered in the accident, he was able to lead a relatively normal life. He has 23 metal plates in his head, his nose was reconstructed from a piece of his skull, and he has lost vision in one eye. However, none of this stopped him from fulfilling his mission. He knew he had a greater purpose, and that gave him the strength to overcome any obstacle. This message is so important that Landon is not the only one who has come forward to narrate his death experience. Two other children and a young man also claimed to have seen Jesus while the world thought they were dead. What did Landon and the others witness? And why did they need to die to see the invisible? Join us as we reveal the terrifying message Landon and the others were instructed to deliver to the world. The Boy Who Died Three times. Landon Whitley was just eight years old when he had the first of his three encounters with Jesus Christ. It all started on a Sunday morning in 1997. Landon got into his parents' car, a Pontiac, with his mother, Julie, and his father, Andy, without knowing what would happen during the trip. They were on their way home from church, with Andy driving. Suddenly, something terrible happened. An ambulance collided with their car at an intersection, hitting the driver's side, where Andy was sitting. Unfortunately, Andy died immediately, 
but rescuers were able to help Julie out of the car shortly after the accident, unaware that there was a child in the vehicle. They didn't see Landon right away because the car was so damaged. Landon was sitting behind his father, and due to the impact of the accident, his body was difficult to find. Julie remembers that the rescuers saw Landon's shoe first, and then looked deeper until they found it. When they got Landon out of the car, he wasn't breathing. Rescuers worked quickly to help him breathe again. Landon's journey was just beginning, and he would need all the help he could get. Landon was brought back to life and taken to the hospital in a special helicopter called Life Flight. He was in terrible condition, and his body stopped functioning twice that day, but the doctors and nurses managed to bring him back to life both times. Even though they were able to save his life, doctors told Julie they didn't believe Landon would survive. They said that if he managed to survive, his brain would be badly damaged and he would be like a baby again, unable to walk, talk, or eat on his own. Julie was so desperate to have her son back that she would accept even this outcome, just to have him alive. Julie felt a lot of pain and sadness when she had to say goodbye to her husband at the funeral. She felt as if God had abandoned her and didn't understand why this tragedy had happened. She was angry and hurt and asked God why he hadn't sent angels to protect them. But even in her sadness and anger, Julie continued to pray to God with all her heart, begging for Landon to live. She was torn between her pain and her hope, and she held on to her faith as tightly as she could. Landon's head was badly injured in the accident, and he fell into a deep sleep called a coma. He was in the hospital hooked up to many machines that helped him breathe and kept his heart beating. Julie, his mother, sat by his side, praying every day for him to wake up. But for two weeks, there was no sign of improvement. The doctors saw nothing that gave them hope. Julie continued praying, begging God for Landon to open his eyes again. Then, something unexpected happened. After two weeks, Landon's eyes opened. The doctors were shocked and happy, and Julie was elated. But the most surprising thing was that Landon didn't have any brain damage. He was fine. Julie knew she needed to break the news of Andy's death to Landon. She was afraid of hurting him even more, but she knew she had to tell the truth. Julie asked Landon if he knew where his father was, and Landon replied that he had seen him in heaven. Landon remembered his time in heaven clearly, even years later. He said he saw his father and also some friends who had died before him. Everyone was together, not saying a word, just being together. Landon also told his mother that he saw two other children in heaven, and Julie was shocked as she had never told Landon about the two miscarriages she had before he was born. Landon's story is a miracle and has stayed with him all these years. He remembers the accident, the coma, and his time in heaven where he saw loved ones who had already passed away. Julie is grateful that her son is alive and well, and she knows that her faith and prayers helped them get through the darkest time of their lives. Landon has a special memory from his time in heaven. He remembers seeing two children who he knew were his brothers and sisters, even though no one had ever told him about them. He says that in heaven, you just know who people are, and you know they belong to you. Landon had three different experiences in heaven, each time he died and came back to life. The third time was special because he met Jesus, who gave him a terrifying message and an important job to do. Jesus told Landon that he had to return to earth and be a good Christian. He also gave Landon the message of his existence and told him to tell others about him. Landon says it was like getting a preview of a movie, where you only see parts of the story, but he knew what he needed to do. Many years later, in 2019, Landon and his mother Julie began sharing their story with others who were hurting and needed hope. They did this through a program called Grief Share 
where people can share their stories and support each other. Julie says she didn't understand why God didn't save her husband's life in 1997, but now she knows angels were there to protect them. She and Landon are living God's plan for their lives and want to help others do the same. They don't want people to get stuck in their pain or anger, but to keep their faith and know that things will get better. Landon wants people to know that Jesus is real, that heaven is real, and that angels are real. He wants people to follow the teachings of Jesus and the Bible and know that life will get better in the end. Landon's experiences in heaven have given him a unique perspective on life, and he wants to share that with others. He knows that Jesus really exists and that he has a plan for every life, and he wants everyone to know that too. Julie wrote a book titled Faith Has Its Reasons, where she shares how God used her difficult experience to bring others closer to him. She is grateful to see her son Landon sharing his story with others, telling them about Jesus and the heaven he experienced. Julie says, It's such a blessing to see Landon spreading the word about Jesus, and she knows it's because Landon has a personal connection with him. Landon was in heaven and saw Jesus, and this experience gave him strong faith. Even though Landon's body was seriously injured in the accident, he is fine today. He has many metal plates in his head, his nose was reconstructed from a piece of his skull, and he can't see out of one eye. But Landon is living a mostly normal life. He is dedicated to sharing his story and telling others about Jesus, because he knows it is what Jesus asked him to do. Landon is confident in his faith and wants everyone to know that Jesus is real, that angels are real, and that heaven is real. He is living proof of God's love and grace and wants to inspire others to have faith too. Before continuing the video, an important message. Don't forget to secure your copy of our exclusive book. It is available in the first pinned comment of this video. Take advantage of this unique opportunity. Landon is not the only child who claims to have died and met Jesus before coming back to life. Zach and Mia's witnesses about seeing Jesus. Another named Zach Clemens, a high school football player, also found himself in a life-threatening situation that led him to meet Jesus. While running in physical education class, he suddenly lost strength and fell to the ground. His heart had stopped beating, and he was technically dead for 20 minutes. Doctors later determined he had suffered sudden cardiac arrest. His mother was called to the scene, and Zach was transported by helicopter to a children's hospital. Miracles. Unfortunately, just as the medical team was about to pronounce his time of death, they detected a pulse. Zach woke up days later, and his recovery was nothing short of a miracle. He shared a personal story of dying, seeing Jesus, and coming back to life. He described the experience in clear detail, remembering what he saw and heard during those minutes without oxygen. Despite the severity of the incident, Zach's sense of humor, strength, and confidence in spreading God's word through his testimony helped him overcome his ordeal. In addition to Landon and Zach, young Mia also had the chance to meet Jesus while unconscious in real life. Melissa Harris reported that in October 2020, she and her husband Mike were enjoying a cabin trip and hiking with their children in the Wayne National Forest in Ohio. On the last day, Mike was carrying his daughter Mia down a path when tragedy struck. Melissa said she heard Mike scream Mia's name in a way that let her know something terrible had happened. Melissa grabbed Mia and held her in her arms, thinking she was dead. Mia seemed lifeless to her, as if there was nothing inside her. A large tree branch had snapped and fallen 60 feet to the ground, hitting Mia square in the head. Melissa said Mia showed no signs of life, and Mike prayed for her to wake up. After almost a minute, Mia let out a scream that seemed to come from the depths of her soul. Melissa 
said it was the worst thing she had ever heard, but at the same time, it was a sign that Mia was alive. Melissa took Mia from Mike, and he went to look for cell phone signal to call 911. It didn't end there. As they waited and prayed for help to arrive, Melissa realized the severity of Mia's injury. She said it wasn't a question of if they would lose Mia, but when. Given the severity of the injury, Melissa remembered touching Mia's head and feeling like her skull was crushed. She cried out to God, asking him not to take her daughter, even if it meant she would leave this earth. Melissa said she believed in God and trusted him, knowing he had the power to change the situation. She remembered a story in the Bible about a woman who was healed by touching the hem of Jesus' robe. Melissa believed that if Jesus' power was strong enough to heal the woman, then God could heal her daughter too. Melissa prayed repeatedly, placing her hands on Mia and asking God to heal her daughter. Meanwhile, the scene at the hospital was chaotic, with Mike running toward the trailhead, desperately searching for cell phone signal. Melissa was crying and praying, holding Mia in her arms and begging God to save her daughter's life. Melissa remembered the sound of Mia's scream and how her daughter's lifeless body felt in her arms. She said it was a moment she would never forget and felt like an eternity while they waited for help to arrive. Melissa couldn't believe this was happening to her family. She described feeling hopeless and helpless, but also the strength of her faith in God. Melissa also remembered the words of the Bible, verse she had read, where Jesus told someone that his faith had healed him. Melissa believed that if Jesus had the power to heal the woman in the Bible, then he could heal Mia too. First responders finally arrived at the scene and took Mia to a nearby hospital. Mike followed them in his car, but stopped to call church staff, asking them to pray for his daughter, begging God to perform a miracle. As Mike prayed, the news quickly spread through church leadership, both locally and internationally. People around the world were praying for Mia, asking God to intervene and save her life. Mia was placed in a medically induced coma and transported to nationwide Children's Hospital. Doctors confirmed she had suffered a traumatic brain injury, a fractured skull, and bleeding on the brain. Mike and Melissa were left with one main unanswered question. Would Mia wake up? The next morning, the hospital staff brought Mia out of the coma, and, to everyone's surprise, she picked up her diaper and said she had peed. To Mike, this was a sign that Mia was still with them and that she would be okay. Although she showed signs of paralysis on the left side of her body, Mia overcame any deficit within three days. Weeks later, she underwent a craniotomy to repair her skull and the laceration in the brain's dura mater. Incredibly, she regained all cognitive functions and her personality remained intact. Mia's recovery was nothing short of miraculous. She was the same fun, hilarious, and witty child she always was, as if nothing had ever happened to her. Months after the accident, Mia confessed to her father that she had had a dream about Jesus, who had taken her home. Mike and Melissa were convinced that God had healed Mia and that his hand was on her life. Mike and Melissa were grateful for the chance to raise their daughter and knew they owed everything to God. Mia made a full recovery, and Mike and Melissa knew they had experienced a miracle and were eternally grateful. An atheist who became a devout Christian. At the age of 19, Bobby Sosa began working as a police officer in the state of New Jersey, and there he saw the dark side of the world. There's a reason he mentioned it in the YouTube video where he told his story. You'll see why soon. Keep watching. Bobby Sosa's grandmother, who raised him, passed away when he was in his mid-twenties. She was one of nine sisters and was known for her strong work ethic 
despite being the poorest among them. Bobby was very resentful and angry at God for taking her away, as she was like a mother figure to him. At age 28, Bobby began his career in finance, and two years later, he left the police department after 12 years of service to focus on his business. It was there that he met his wife, with whom he now has three children. Although Bobby's wife was a devout Christian, he didn't share her beliefs. He accompanied her to church for support, but he didn't genuinely connect with the faith. He struggled with resentment and anger at God, especially after his grandfather's death two years after his grandmother's death. For most of his life, Bobby didn't care about God or Jesus. He was too consumed by his own pain and resentment. But on March 23, 2020, Bobby experienced a life-changing incident. He went to bed feeling fine, but woke up having trouble breathing, as if someone was kicking him in the chest. Bobby remembered his training as a police officer and curled into a fetal position to ease his breathing. He was unaware that his wife had called 911 and paramedics and police arrived at his home. One of the officers helped Bobby to his feet, and that was the last thing he remembered. According to Bobby, he didn't want to get up, but the officer's outstretched hand and kind words convinced him to accept the help and get up. Bobby's wife filled in the blanks, revealing that he had turned blue and was unresponsive before the officer arrived. He asked if he should share his and his wife's sides of the story, or just his. He then described how he remembered being pulled by someone and then feeling like he was floating in a black space, unable to see or hear anything. According to Bobby's wife, he was placed in a stair chair and carried down the stairs by paramedics, who instructed him not to hold on to the walls. Despite being in a spiritual realm, Bobby was coherent and spoke to his wife, saying how tired he was and apologizing. Bobby's wife remembered that his eyes rolled back and he lost consciousness. He was rushed to an ambulance where CPR was performed. Bobby's heart stopped again, and he lay dead for more than 40 minutes before he was stabilized and taken to the nearest hospital. Due to his critical condition, Bobby was taken to the nearest hospital, where he arrived clinically dead. His wife, a former EMT, could only visit him for five minutes every hour due to hospital restrictions. Bobby later met to the first responders who saved his life and learned that he had arrived at the hospital clinically dead. Bobby Sosa's wife was unable to stay with him in the hospital due to the New Jersey lockdown, but she was able to visit him briefly. And during one of those visits, she fervently pleaded, prayed for him to come back to life. She remembers whispering in his ear, that he didn't dare die and leave her a widow at such a young age, so he better get up and go back. But despite their efforts, things didn't improve. Bobby's condition worsened, and he lost consciousness again. The medical team informed Bobby's wife that she had to say goodbye as they were unsure if he would survive. But her spiritual mentor intervened, advising her to speak life into Bobby and not listen to the nurses. With new determination, Bobby's wife entered his hospital room, praying loudly and fervently. The medical team was drawn to his prayers, and soon a miraculous opening in the hospital's ICU became available. Bobby was rushed to the ICU, and his wife was unable to say goodbye before he was taken away. But she believes her prayers and faith were responsible for the sudden turnaround that saved his life. While all of this was happening in the physical world, Bobby describes a completely different experience in the spiritual realm. He felt like he was floating in a black space, unable to see or hear anything. Suddenly, a figure materialized on the right side of his foot, and Bobby was shocked to realize it was Jesus. Overwhelmed with remorse, he began to apologize, convinced that Jesus was real. Jesus floated around Bobby's feet before coming over and lifting him up in a soft, wedding-like hug. Bobby Sosa describes a profound experience in the spiritual realm where he encountered a tall, olive-skinned figure with deep-set eyes and shoulder-length hair. 
This being held Bobby in a very peaceful and loving way, communicating without words. Bobby felt a deep connection, knowing he would be okay. The figure disappeared into the darkness, leaving Bobby floating like a ghost. He then saw his friend Mark, a former police officer and client who had passed away. Mark often expressed concerns about his wife's well-being if something happened to him. Bobby had promised to take care of her, and now, in the spiritual realm, he reassured Mark that he had kept his promise. Mark was grateful, and they hugged, discussing their experiences on Earth. Bobby remembered their last conversation, where he had promised to take care of Mark's wife. Mark expressed gratitude, and Bobby reiterated that he cared for him. The conversation was brief, but meaningful, focusing on shared experiences, not deaths. It was a continuation of their friendship, with no mention of them being dead or what they were doing in the spiritual realm. Bobby Sosa woke up in the ICU nine days after his near-death experience, confused and disoriented. He had a full beard and no memory of what had happened. The ICU was chaotic, with doctors and patients running through the corridors. Bobby felt helpless and scared, with no one explaining what had happened to him. The first person he saw was an Asian gentleman in full protective gear who called him Robert, but made no response. Bobby's instincts kicked in, and he became defensive, refusing to let anyone touch him. He assessed his body and realized he couldn't even move his left leg. While watching TV, he saw news about COVID-19 and wondered if that was what he had, but he never had COVID-19, despite being tested several times. Bobby's mind was racing, and he became paranoid that the medical team was trying to harm him or steal his organs. He refused to sleep or eat for fear of being poisoned. This continued for two and a half days, until one night a nurse was at his bedside and a black man in green scrubs walked in. Bobby was starting to put his routines together and realized it was nighttime. The man in green scrubs approached Bobby gently. Bobby had never seen anyone at the hospital wearing those colors before. The man reached out to touch Bobby's left wrist, and Bobby reacted instinctively, telling him to move away. Bobby demanded to know who he was, and the man calmly introduced himself, calling Bobby my son. Bobby was surprised by the man's kind words and asked again who he was. The man then explained that he was a prayer warrior sent by Bobby's wife, who had been praying for him outside the hospital every night with their children. Bobby was skeptical at first, but the man's words resonated with him. Bobby's wife had mentioned the term prayer warrior before, and hearing it again brought her peace. He began to calm down and accepted the man's help. The man touched Bobby's wrist again, and this time Bobby allowed it. The man thanked Bobby, and Bobby felt relieved again. Two weeks later, Bobby was coherent and aware of his surroundings. He remembered dying five times in one day and the entire experience. He shared this with his wife, who was amazed by the story. She tried to find the mysterious man Kendrick, but there was no record of him at the hospital. Only then did she realize that she had prayed for Jesus to appear in the flesh and calm Bobby and understood who Kendrick could be. Bobby learned a valuable lesson from his experience. God is real and his presence can be felt in times of need. As he recounted in his video testimony, Bobby Sosa recalled reading a book by a neurologist who had a near-death experience and saw Jesus. This experience made Bobby realize that God is real and that we don't die. We move on to another life. When we pass to the other side, we lose five emotions. Worry, doubt, fear, pain, and suffering. These emotions disappear, and we gain peace and an overwhelming love that cannot be described. Bobby experienced this love when he crossed over to the other side and came back to life three weeks later. He told his wife that he wouldn't mind dying again because the love he experienced was so beautiful and pure.
Bobby has learned that there is nothing to fear about the unknown because he knows what the other side is like. He wants to share his experience with others to bring them peace and comfort. Bobby believes everyone has their own journey and may not know where they are in their lives. He wants to share his testimony with others so they can understand that there is peace, tranquility, and love on the other side. Bobby's experience changed his life. He used to be aggressive and always kept himself busy. Bobby's experience also made him realize that we are born with only two fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Everything else is influenced by our experiences and environment. When we cross to the other side, we gain pure love, and it is like a blanket that wraps around us, giving us peace. Bobby Sosa said his life has changed dramatically since his encounter with Jesus. He now shares his testimony with everyone he meets, as he doesn't know what others might be going through. He is happy to have received positive feedback from people who were inspired by his story. Bobby said some people shared their concerns about loved ones who were dying or had passed away, and he was able to offer comfort and reassurance, even describing details about their loved ones that only they would know. Bobby then personally contacted his biological mother, stepfather, and biological father, and now their relationships are respectful. He observed that forgiveness is for our own benefit, not that of others, and learned to prioritize relationships and make time for loved ones. Your work is no longer the center of your universe. Ultimately, Bobby said he understood that he is not in control of his life. Jesus and God are. When things don't go as planned, he trusts that another door will open, and life becomes less stressful when we surrender to a higher power. Bobby concluded that he learned to shrug his shoulders when things don't go as expected, trusting that everything is part of the plan. His experience has given him a new perspective on life, and he hopes to inspire others to find peace and trust in a higher power. Tragedies he faced and the physical limitations he must navigate, he found a way to persevere and live life to the fullest. Her story is one of courage, strength, and the power of love to overcome even the most daunting obstacles. We believe that God is sending a message to Christians around the world about the return of Jesus Christ. If you are serious about your faith, focus on living a holy life. Take time to pray for those who have not yet found their path, and share your faith whenever you can. It's all in the Bible, guiding us on how to live and spread the word. Do you believe that Jesus is real and that God is alive? We'd love to know in the comments. If you enjoyed watching this video, don't forget to leave a like, share with your family and friends, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss our next updates.